And we don't know if this is exactly the same, but it seems that Apollos' deficiency was that he accurately preached about Christ, but he had not really received instruction about the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is simply another word that the New Testament uses for conversion and the gifting of the Holy Spirit that every Christian has, not a second blessing, but the first work of the Spirit in every believer's life, that he's preaching about Jesus. And, and as best as we can figure, Priscilla and Aquila listen and they think, that's really good. It's really good. Okay, I hope he's going to say something about the Holy Spirit. I think he's going to say something, say something about Pentecost, say, ha, huh. okay, didn't say anything about it. Uh, we, we need to talk to him. And so maybe they said, look, what, what you're saying is great. It's amazing. You're refuting people. We just want to support this. But we, we just want you to know, you may not have heard about what happened at Pentecost and how the Holy Spirit came and fell upon the believers there and how the Holy Spirit indwells us and equips us for ministry and how the Holy Spirit is the seal of our inheritance, how the Holy Spirit is the testimony that this Jesus is the Christ because He ascended into heaven and poured out His Spirit. Apollos, this is, this is one of your, your arguments. We're giving you another argument that Jesus is the Christ, and that's the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So graciously, wisely, privately, they speak to Him. They're not looking to tear Him down. They don't pounce at the first sign of weakness. And neither were they so blown away by His fruitfulness or giftedness that they thought, well, He's untouchable. He's untouchable. We can't say anything to Him. They knew this guy is gifted, he's bright, he's effective. We don't want to jeopardize the good work he's doing. We don't want to undermine his teaching, but we do want to help. And so they give him a more accurate way. He, he, he was, wasn't preaching what is wrong, but he wasn't giving everything that was right. And they help him teach a more accurate way. And I want you to notice incidentally here, that we see both Priscilla and Aquila coming together to help him grow in this area. There are prohibitions in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Timothy 2 against women teaching in the church, which is why we have men serving as elders and men who will be pastors and preachers here. But a text like this helps us to see that this is not an absolute prohibition against a man ever learning something from a woman. Sometimes people will speak very dismissively like that, but that's not what the New Testament is teaching. We see in the New Testament women teaching in their homes, women teaching children, women teaching other women, and here we have a woman with her husband, and perhaps because Priscilla is often mentioned first, maybe she was the more outgoing, the more prominent, we don't know why. But certainly, she was an important part of this team, and we see that Priscilla with her husband privately teaching another man. So it's not like the Bible says a man can't learn something from a woman or a woman can't uh, ever teach a man something. Certainly, they can. Calvin says, we see that at the, that time, women were not so ignorant of the Word of God as the papists will have them. For as much as we see that one of the chief teachers of the church was instructed by a woman, notwithstanding, we must remember that Priscilla did execute this function of teaching at him in her house that she might not, over, uh, might not overthrow the order prescribed by God and nature. Just let this be an encouragement. We want women who love the Word of God, who are rich and deep in theology and know what they believe, and we ought to be humble to learn from each other in all sorts of different contexts. 